Hi, my name is Charlie Renault, and I am a member of the Oregon Buddhist Temple. Koichi Mizushima graduated UC Davis in 1995 with a bachelor's degree in management economics and, over the years, has owned three Japanese restaurants. Sounds like I should be asking him for stock picks or maybe restaurant recommendations. At the Sacramento Betsuin, he has re-established the junior YBA program, co-taught first grade Dharma school, became a minister's assistant, completed the Jodo Shinshu correspondence course, and has been programs director. He is currently BCA youth coordinator and is part of the BCA Center for Buddhist Education staff. Please enjoy his Dharma message. Greetings, everyone. It is such a great honor to be one of the presenters at this year's Northwest District Convention. You have some amazing and very accomplished speakers that will be sharing messages with you this uh, entire week. But for those of you that tuned in today, you only get me. So uh, I apologize for that. Um, my name is uh, Koichi Mizushima, and I am currently working as the youth director for the Buddhist Churches of America. And I am so fortunate that I have had the chance to attend the Northwest District Convention back when it was held in Seattle many years ago. And over the years, I have had the pleasure to meet so many wonderful people from the Northwest District. And I look forward to meeting all of you someday in person in the future. It is so timely that we are talking about today's theme because I, along with Reverend Dennis Fujimoto from the Alameda Buddhist Temple are putting together one of the first ever BCA virtual art exhibits. And this will go, uh, this will debut on the BCA website actually on the very last day of this convention. I believe that's September 19th, 2021. So that's when our virtual BCA art exhibit will go live on Buddhist Churches of America.org. So please tune in at the last day of this convention event, you can tune right into the BCA website and take a look at that art exhibit. So the timing for this was all really, really perfect. Uh, we asked members from all over the BCA to submit artwork, so it should be a really, really wonderful and great event. So speaking of art, right? Art, what an amazing theme that uh, you all chose for this convention. When I first got the invitation to speak at this event many months ago, uh, I began to start thinking about what I wanted to talk about. And I couldn't remember the exact theme because there's a really big description that goes along with it. And uh, I was just thinking it was, oh, realization, appreciation, and transformation. And then I realized that would spell rat. So that probably, we're probably not going to have a rat convention. So that wasn't right. But of course, as we know, the theme for this year is appreciation, realization, and transformation, which spells art. And I'm going to be talking a little bit about art and a little bit about all the points of the theme today. And I'm going to talk about just some personal stories. That's the way I thought I'd uh, approach today. So I uh, am a huge movie fan. I love movies. Uh, and when I first heard this theme, it immediately reminded me of one of my favorite films. And this, this film is an old one. It's back from 1989 and it's called Dead Poet Society. Uh, I hope you've all had a chance to see this at one time, but um, it's with Robin Williams. Robin Williams plays a poetry professor at a very prestigious private school. And uh, this is this one scene with Robin Williams as the professor and uh, he, he's in his classroom and, uh, you know, these kids are all very uptight, their uniforms or their coats and ties. They're very, very proper. And uh, Robin Williams kind of walks in the middle of the class and he goes, huddle up, huddle up. And he makes the kids huddle up around him. And then he delivers this line. And he says this, the human race is filled with passion, medicine, law, business, and engineering. These are noble pursuits and necessary to sustain life. But poetry, beauty, art, and love, these are what we stay alive for. And I didn't even realize that this film was almost over 30 years old already, or 30, over 30 years old. But that particular scene really resonated with me throughout my life. 
it's really shaped the way I look at the world and it's just how I try to live my life. Art is an expression of human passion and human feeling. It is not something that's quite measurable, right? It's not really definable. And sometimes it's not even logical. It is this intangible thing that tells this human story about what it means to be alive. And the wonderful thing about art is that it means something different to each and every person. You could have a hundred different people looking at the exact same thing. And each one of them, every single one of them could feel something potentially different or they could take away something different. And for me, Buddhism shares some definite similarities with that. Although we all may listen to the same Buddhist lectures, although we may all read the same Buddhist texts, and we may even hear the same Buddhist stories and fables, the way we interpret each of these things and the way we apply all of these teachings in our lives could be very different, right? We have all read that there are 84,000 paths to enlightenment. And I, I, when I first read that, I thought, oh, how specific. But it's not specifically 84,000 that's important. The point of that passage is there's more than one way. There is more than one path to understanding. There's more than one path to resolving your life suffering, right? There's more than one way. There are many, many ways. And that's what this is about. And that's what art is about. So although there are many different ways to, uh, to, to choose, you know, to walk your path, there are many different paths that we can choose. I believe that what brings us all together as Shin Buddhists is the way we try to discover our path or the way we try to choose our path, the way we approach that choice. That's what makes us Shin Buddhist, right? Our paths may be different, but the way and the thought process and our approach to finding that path is what ties us all together. So how do you determine your path? Well, for me, when I'm trying to go somewhere, I typically would get into my car and drive there, right? Well, you know, what happens when you're trying to go somewhere that you've never been before? You don't know exactly how to get there, the directions. Well, that's easy, isn't it? In today's world, that's a piece of cake. You all have your, your, your special smartphones and uh, all you have to do is open up your little navigation app and you type in your destination and boom, you got a satellite signal and it will tell you step by step how to get there, right? Well, back in, back in my day, uh, back in the good old days, we used to have uh, paper maps. I mean, we, paper maps still exist, of course, but uh, for those of you that are probably younger drivers, when was the last time you can honestly say you've ever really unfolded and looked at a paper map? I would probably argue that it's something you've never done. Um, but uh, I don't know if any of you are familiar with, do you remember that Thomas Guide? I don't know if that's a regional specific publication, but there was this book called the Thomas Guide. And it was this cool little book, a thick book, and it was just full of maps, you know? Um, and it was awesome because you would look up the address of your destination, you'd look it up in the back, you'd find the page, and then you'd turn to that page and you'd find where it is. And then you got to kind of go backwards to find out where you are so you can track the necessary directions to get to your destination. And um, as you approached a portion of the map and you go, OK, I got to go up here. Oh, and then you look at the top and it would say, go turn to page B11. You'd go to B11. And anyway, it was like mapping your way. It was like one of those choose your own adventure books. That's probably another old reference that the younger people won't know. But anyway. But now, anyway, we all have smartphones, right? And if you're really fancy, you even have that navigation screen that's built right into your car. So you don't even have to open your phone. You just boop and tell them where to go. So here's what a typical GPS navigation screen looks like. I'm sure all of you have seen it. You've all seen this a million times. This is incredibly common. And you're watching where you're going, right? And obviously, you all see that big blue arrow in the middle, right? And we all know what that arrow represents, right? That arrow represents you. But as you travel along your life path, you know, um, it's a little bit different, right? It's not so obvious. But when you're looking at the GPS, as you travel along on your GPS screen, what do you notice about that? What do you notice about that blue arrow? 
I know it's kind of obvious, but as you're looking at the arrow, what happens to the arrow? Does the arrow really move? Does it move a whole lot? No, it doesn't, does it? As you look at this image, you realize the arrow doesn't move that much. Instead, the entire map is revolving and moving around the arrow. It's moving around you. The entire world is moving and shifting to accommodate you. I mean, is that how life works for, for anyone? No, of course not, right? Because in real life, you're not a GPS arrow. Okay, well, yeah, you don't get to just stay in one place, right? While the world revolves around you and caters to your every whim. But how many of you know people that kind of behave like that in their life? How many, how many of you know somebody that kind of behaves or acts like, hey, I'm just going to not move and be rigid and make the entire world move around to accommodate me? Yeah. I know it's, you know, it's uh, through Zoom, but I, I see you nodding your heads. I see a lot of people nodding their heads going, yeah, I know someone like that. Well, guess what? I guarantee you that each and every one of you knows someone like that. You know why? Because you all know yourselves. We are all like this from time to time. Hopefully some of us are less like this, uh, less often like this, but we all have this tendency to have a self-centered view, a centric, an egocentric view. And Jodo Shinshu understands this about us, about our human nature. It understands this. And it understands our human nature to behave like the blue arrow, I guess is what I'm saying. And it is easy to forget that the reality of the world cannot only be seen through our eyes, right? It's, it's easy to forget that because we only see the world through our eyes. That's the only means that we have to perceive the world. So of course we see it through our own perspective. After all, there's not a, any other way to directly see it, right? We only have one set of eyes. But even though that's how we perceive the world, what we have to try to do is remember that that's not the only way in which the world is perceived. We have to bear in mind that the world is perceived by others. And when we can do this, that is how we can truly appreciate the Buddhist teachings, right? So just realizing and appreciating that isn't enough. We have to take that additional step and transform our lives once we learn all this, okay? So here's an example of what I mean when I say, we all see the world through a different lens. Um, this is just an example of something that we have at home, right? And I, I'm sure all of you have seen this. You all know what this is, right? It's an, it's an air fryer, right? You, you've all seen this thing before, right? And so, uh, you know, that's like the little, uh, the little basket thing. And then, you know, at the bottom of the basket, it has that little removable, uh, I don't know what you call it. It's like a pan thing at the bottom. So some of the grease can leak down to the bottom and the air can get up through it. So it's a little removable pan. It's a flat panel uh, pan piece, right? And uh, I remember one time uh, I, I had it all washed and I had it in the dishwasher. And I was standing near, but I was just off to the side of the dishwasher area where the, where the sink was. And my wife, Janet, was standing right in front of it. She was standing right in front of the dish rack. And I was asking her, hey, can you um, can you grab that bottom pan piece to the air fryer? Can you get the thing? And I'm standing right here, not five feet away, just looking at it. And I'm looking right at the piece. I'm looking at the piece that we're talking about, okay? And she's standing right there looking directly at the rack going, what what pan thing? I don't, I don't see it. And I honestly thought that she was uh, kind of kidding around with me and, and messing with me. And I went, no, no, just, just grab it real quick. We got to put it in the thing and, you know, we got to start the fryer. And she's all, what? I don't see it. I don't see it. Now, at this point, I was starting to be in a state of complete and total disbelief. I, I didn't believe her. I said, I'm looking at it with my own eyes. Are you like, are you playing a trick on me? Is this some kind of a, a prank? Are you videotaping this? Am I on a prank show? What is happening? But I could tell through her body language that she was being very serious. She could not see the piece that I was looking at. And I said, it's impossible. I'm standing right here looking directly at it. 
So as I walked over to where she was standing, I finally looked at the dish rack from her view, from her perspective. And this is what I saw. <laughs> so she didn't realize this is what I saw. And I didn't realize this is what she saw. And as we went back and forth, I was like, oh my goodness. It was such a simple shift in perspective, but it made all the difference in the world. And this is something that happens with all of us, right? And we just, it's impossible to understand because we place so much value, especially in our culture here. We place so much value in, you've all heard the word, seeing is believing, or I saw it with my own eyes. I saw it with my own eyes, so I know it's true. Our, our judicial system places so much value in eyewitnesses. There was an eyewitness account. But when you study this a little bit further, you realize how, how varying our perception is, our own view. Um, here's another favorite little video clip of mine. Uh, I found this on YouTube many years ago. And um, this comes right into our theme today also of art. And uh, just watch this clip. I think it's really cool. Wasn't that so neat? Um, I don't know if you've seen that before. Um, I've shared this before, but uh, still one of my favorite clips ever. And um, again, illustrates this similar point. From one perspective, something can look nonsensical. It can make absolutely no sense and look like a jumble and a mess and something with no meaning. But take a few steps this way change your mindset on what your expectations are and bam you see an amazing image obviously with these examples these are pretty very basic simple easy to see examples and uh to most people you're like oh that's obvious that's obvious i can shift this way and look that way that's obvious but just to articulate how strong our personal sense of self is and how strong our ego is it's really hard to get an idea out of your head, especially once you've seen it with your own eyes. Once you have seen a truth and you have come to a conclusion about something, it is very, very, very difficult to change that reality. And this is why we have a lot of conflict in our personal relationships, maybe even in our temple relationships. <laughs> no, um, but it's difficult. And that's the challenge that we have when we approach things that we disagree on or things that are of debate or things that have multiple perspectives. We settle into our place where we're so certain of what we know and what we see to be the truth. And that is the hardest thing, again, to adjust. Um, and especially when you see something with your own eyes and when you see something as your own truth. So those two examples are kind of like, well, I would know if I was there, I would know if I was in a museum and I was looking at a jumble of stuff, I knew there'd be some kind of trick to it. So I would eventually figure it out. Right. So th this next example, again, 
I am the least academic of all of your speakers. So I'm giving you uh, YouTube video clips, movie clips, and now finally I'm gonna move into the world of television, okay? Uh, I never even really watched this show too often to be honest with you, but uh, for whatever reason, I just happened to remember this particular episode. And I was struck by it, I think. I was struck by it because I thought it was so clever. It was so cleverly done. So this show is called Malcolm in the Middle. And it's it's one of these shows where it's a mom, it's a busy, busy household. They, they got three kids, you know, they're running around just just as a regular, you know, a family life, everyday family life, running around, going here, going there. And just to set up this uh, scene, the mom is the true captain of the household, as you would say, I guess. She's the one that's in charge. The mom, mom is organized. Mom knows what's going on. Mom knows how to get from here to there and do this and that. And mom gets everything done. Mom is the authority, always. No one questions mom. Mom is always right. And typically, she usually is. So the family usually doesn't question her. Um, so let's just take a look at what, what happens here. You'll see the little uh, uh, adventure she goes through for this day. What? I didn't do anything. Make you run for it, Mom. We can be on the news. You? License and registration, please. What's this all about? You impeded traffic. When you pulled out, that Volkswagen had to slam on its brakes. What Volkswagen? I looked over my left when I pulled out. There was no car. License and registration, ma'am. <sighs> right. Don't think I don't know what this is all about. It's because I made you pay for that iced tea. Oh, was that you? Now, if you just sit tight, I got to do some paperwork, run a computer check. It may take a little while. The computer's kind of slow. Yeah, well, knock yourself out. My record is clean. There is no way I have 16 unpaid parking tickets. The computer's wrong. You are not getting away with this. I'm not getting a point in my license because I'm taking this to court. I did nothing wrong, and I've got three eyewitnesses to prove it. They saw exactly what happened. Blah, 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 blah. Blah, 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 blah. Dewey, 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 Dewey. You right, Mom. You said, Mom. See how? It's a clear case of entrapment. Cop doesn't get his free iced tea, so he trumps up a cockamamie ticket. Well, we're gonna fight this. Wait, are there cameras all over this place? Oh yeah. Is there one in the parking lot? Wait, stop! There's our van. She did it. She's guilty. Mom's wrong. What? Mom made a mistake? Oh my goodness, I can't believe it. Mom made a mistake. Mom was wrong. They can't believe it. It's like this has never happened in the family before that mom was wrong. Mom's usually the one that's always right. Mom is always on point, right? So they can't believe it. They can't believe it. And mom actually, after after seeing that uh, video surveillance clip, mom was devastated because mom was so certain of her view of what happened, her view of reality, her personal take of reality. She was so certain that she was right. As you saw, she was so adamant that she was right. She could not even remotely perceive of any other possibility. She clearly thought the officer was completely wrong. He made a personal mistake. Uh, there was a scene earlier that, that would give her cause to believe that he had a personal uh, beef against her, if you will. So she knew in her mind and came to that conclusion that she was 100% in the right, right? And now look, we saw some uh, visual proof that stated otherwise. 
she was truly devastated. And that was that, right? So we think. So we think. Now, the part two of this episode. Let's take a look at what happens next. Where's Lois? Did I miss her? Craig. You guys are not going to believe what I have. I have a surveillance arrangement with the manager of the mini mart across the street. One of their cameras caught Lois from a different angle right before she got her ticket. See? Lois was right all along. This completely exonerates her. Isn't this great? Say what? How the tables have turned, right? It's amazing how things turn. Just when we all thought that we all arrived at a unanimous conclusion, right? We all saw the video together the first time. Every one of us saw it and we said, oh man, it was her fault. Clearly, 100% done. 100%. We all came to that conclusion seeing the video. Yet, one broader view, one different view, one more clear view showed us a different reality, a different truth, if you will. I guess what I'm trying to say is this. Uh, this is all for fun. I get it. It's, it's for TV, and, and I get it. But... Um, it does illustrate a really, really amazing truth here is that coming to a conclusion, arriving at a conclusion comes from our ego self. It comes from our ego because it comes from, it is our conclusion, correct? It is not the conclusion. It's not a universal conclusion that is arrived upon by a large body of people. It is our conclusion. And this is not to say that uh, things did or didn't happen in a certain way, because clearly in life, things did happen. Uh, somebody did make an illegal U-turn. She did get cut off, whatever. Um, but the point here isn't necessarily about who is right and who is wrong, as, as was with me and my wife, Janet. The pan was there, but it wasn't there for her. The point isn't who's right and who's wrong. The point of this, in the point of this entire talk today is, I guess it's about the realization. It's about the realization that the suffering and the conflict comes from that place where you believe so strongly that only your ego view is right, that only your personal sense of rightness is the only way to look at the world and to look at life. And when you think that way so self-centeredly and without any room for any other type of possibilities or even considerations of other people's views, thoughts, feelings, and experiences, when you shut out everyone else, this is what leads to your struggle, your dukkha, your suffering, your hardship. When you leave no room for any other possibility and only let your own ego guide you, this is what causes the hardship and struggle, not only in your life, but in those lives that are connected to yours, right? And I guess when you finally realize that, that's when you can really start to appreciate. That's when you can really start to appreciate the importance of others, the value and the necessity of others. We are all interconnected beings, and that's what that means. We don't do anything all on our own. No matter how accomplished you are, how educated you are, how smart you are, how, how hardworking you are, or how talented you are, no one can do anything all on their own. No one can exist all on their own. No one can succeed all on their own. No one fails all on their own. It's all tied together. And that is that appreciation. That is that realization of those two things that hopefully make all of us want to transform our lives into something different. So this is what Jodo Shinshu teaches us to truly realize the nature of who we are, the nature of what we are, and realize that the root of our suffering does in fact come from ourselves. And if we can appreciate everyone and everything in our lives with more genuine gratitude, 
then we can make our lives something better. And not just our lives, but the lives that are all around us. And that's what's important. When we stop doing just for you, and you start doing for others and everyone else, you will find that it ends up benefiting you as a byproduct in the end. And that's the whole ironic part. The more you struggle just to do it for yourself, that's when you run into the most hardship. And the more you start to shift that attitude and shift that whole perspective to do to others, that's when it all ends up coming back and benefiting you anyway. Um, so I hope that that's something we can apply to this very interesting time of our lives right now, uh, whether it is about health, whether it's about your political views, whether it's your views on equality and all these other issues that are very much on the forefront of our thoughts and our consciousness right now. I think no matter what you decide, no matter what you want to uh, fight for, if we begin from a place of considering others, I think that that is the best way to go. And I think that is what best exhibits this year's theme of art at the Northwest District Convention. Namo Amidomits, Namo Amidomits, Namo Amidomits, Namo Amidomits, Namo Amidomits.